In this Grasshopper tutorial, I'm going to summarize the basics of the program. This is a great and easy tutorial for Grasshopper beginners and can serve as a crash course into parametric design for Grasshopper. I'll cover the basic Grasshopper interface, how to create parametric relationships, simple patterns, animations, data trees, how to install plugins, and just general workflow tips. So what is Grasshopper? Grasshopper is an algorithmic plugin for Rhino, and Grasshopper gives us parametric control over a series of relationships that we're able to define through a node-based interface. It could be considered as a method of visual coding, and it's a great way to gain great, greater control over your design in Rhino. With Grasshopper, we can in theory create infinite design options through a series of relationships we design and control in Grasshopper. Let's take a first look at the Grasshopper interface. If you're opening Grasshopper the, for the first time, there's kind of two ways you could get the interface up. The first would be to click on this little launch Grasshopper icon under the standard tab in Rhino. And the second would be to simply type in Grasshopper into the command line. And you'll get um, a little loading screen and then your Grasshopper window will appear. I'm just going to go and create a new document. So I've got a blank kind of document. And my first tip for you is when you're using Grasshopper, don't go full screen with Grasshopper. You want to use it in conjunction with Rhino. So try and dock it so you've got like a half screen, half Rhino screen, and you can use those two things in tandem. So the general interface is pretty simple. You've got your typical file menu at the top. Then we've got a bunch of tabs with things called components. And I'll talk about components shortly, but they're basically the building blocks of Grasshopper. And then below that, we've got this big gray open space called the Grasshopper Canvas. Navigating the Grasshopper Canvas is pretty easy. You can scroll in and out with your mouse to zoom in and out. And then you can hold the right hand mouse button down and pan to move around the canvas quickly. As I mentioned before, the building blocks of Grasshopper are basically these things called components. And components actually kind of relate to the things that we typically do in Rhino. For example, if I were to create a sphere in Rhino, I would type in sphere into the command line, and I'd get a bunch of options that um, specify how I'd go about creating the sphere. I could click and then define a radius for my sphere. I could do that manually, give it like a radius of 20, hit return and create a sphere. Grasshopper is quite similar, but we get a lot more control over some of these parameters in the sphere interactively. So let's go ahead and try and create a sphere inside of Grasshopper using a Grasshopper component. To create a sphere, let's navigate to the surface tab and go to the primitive drop down menu under that. We got a few options for spheres. I'm just going to go with the typical sphere um, option here. I'm going to click once. You'll see my um, cursor has changed to have a little plus sign, and this is prompting me to drop my first component onto the Grasshopper Canvas. So I'm just going to click here onto the Grasshopper Canvas. So I might zoom in a little bit just to get started. And you'll see two things have happened. We've got a little battery-like object on our Grasshopper Canvas, which is our first component. And then over here in our um, Rhino window, we've got a little red previewed sphere that's occurring. And these things are related. If I click on the sphere, you'll notice it turns green. And that tells me that that's this kind of previewed geometry that um, we've selected in Grasshopper. What I mean by previewed is right now, I can't actually select this geometry in Rhino. It's purely a preview. I can't touch it. I can't move it. Basically, all of my transformations will be, have to be happening inside of Grasshopper as we move forward with this. There is a much easier way for us to kind of find objects in um, Grasshopper. So obviously, when we want to do something in Rhino, usually we just have a guess. If I want to create a box, I type in box, and I get a lot of you know options for box creation, basically. And we can do a similar thing in Grasshopper. So I'm just going to delete this guy. If I double click on the canvas and I type in sphere, I'll be able to find the sphere component um, right there and just click and that'll create it then. So once again, you double click on the canvas with your left hand mouse button and just type in whatever you want. So if you wanted to create a box, you could also type in box and create that as well. We're going to keep going with our sphere to begin with though. So most Grasshopper components have some kind of combination of things called inputs and outputs. So these are little kind of nodes that you see in our sphere. And these inputs and outputs kind of give us control over the properties of our object. In the case of the sphere, we have two inputs and one output. And to understand what these are, we can just hover over those, um, the names of those inputs and outputs. So one of the inputs is the base plane, which basically specifies the location and the orientation of our sphere. And you can see it previewed as this little grid here. That's our base plane for the sphere. 
The R input is the radius, which is currently set to 1. So by default, our sphere has a base plane of just the world XY that you see generally in Rhino, and a radius of 1. And what it outputs is a untrimmed surface. So the resulting sphere actually comes out as a surface geometry. So we can actually affect the properties of this sphere by parametrically changing these inputs and outputs. Um, the easiest way to test this is to first create something called a number slider, and we're going to create a number slider that allows us to change the sphere radius. The easiest way to create a number slider is to double click on the canvas and don't search for number slider, just type in the value that you want um, for your sphere radius. So I'm going to go with a value of 5. And what it'll do is create this slider um, with a value of 5, but it has a domain of 0 to 10, and I can easily slide it across to change its value. I'm going to leave it at 5 for now, and then I'm going to update this radius of the sphere to be the same as this number slider. So to do that, with my left mouse button, I'm going to hold coming out of the slider, and I'll get a little arrow. I'm going to drag that in, and it's going to snap into the radius of my sphere. So I'm going to snap and let go, and you'll see that my sphere size has changed as a preview in the Rhino viewport. And that's because I've increased the radius. And this can change dynamically. So as I slide this number slider along, I can dynamically change the radius of our sphere. So there's a few other types of inputs that we could use in Grasshopper to affect things like this. I could create something called a, um, a panel. And panels are really fantastic tools for using as inputs, but also using to see what you've got as an output. So for example, I could make my panel dot by double clicking on it, change it to a value of 7 and plug that into radius, um, and that'll make my sphere a size of 7 units. But then I could also plug the S output into the panel, and it'll just tell me that I have um, a surface coming out of this sphere component. So I have one surface. And this is really useful when you've got multiple objects coming out of your component, because then you can clearly see what's actually coming out of the outputs. So We've created a number slider, and this is um, of the type number. And there's like a series of different uh, data types, as we would call them, inside a grasshopper. So as I hover over this radius output, you'll see this little 0.1 icon next to the radius. And that indicates that the sphere wants to take in a number input. The B um, input, the base, wants to take in a plane input. So you can see that based on the little icon as well. And a few of the different data types that you'll be using in Grasshopper can kind of be found um, in their primitive um, section up here under geometry. So we could create points, and this will give us a point container, but it also shares the same icon um, as a point. We could create curves. Um, we can create planes, as we know. And points can actually serve as inputs for planes often. They can be interchangeable geometry types. Uh, as we know, we could create surfaces. Uh, we can create meshes, and quite importantly, we can create something called a brep. Now, a brep can be thought of as a poly surface, um, which you would be familiar with if you're a Rhino user. So just think of a brep as a poly surface. Surfaces and breps can also be used interchangeably as well. So if I plug this sphere into here, it'll light up green um, without any issues as well. So that's just an overview of a few of the different data types that you'll come across in Grasshopper. I'm going to keep my point container because I'm going to quickly talk about how these um, simple geometry containers here that only have one input and one output can actually be used to reference geometry inside of Rhino. So if I were to go and create a point in Rhino by just typing in point and just dropping a point onto the canvas, I can actually create a relationship between my Grasshopper canvas and this point. So I'm going to come over to my point container, I'm going to right click, and I am going to set one point. I'm then asked to kind of select an object to reference, so I'm going to just do a marquee over that point there, and you'll see that this point um, kind of turns, like has a little bit of a red cross on it. So now if I move the point in Rhino, you'll see that it um, its location updates in the Grasshopper preview. So the Grasshopper preview of this point is now tethered to the point physically in Rhino. And now we could go ahead and create a parametric relationship. So a parametric relationship is basically a relationship between two objects that we define in Grasshopper. 
Now, Grasshopper typically reads left to right, so objects to the left of our definition can affect objects further downstream to the right of our definition. And I'll show this in action right now. So this point geometry, um, I mentioned before that points can serve as planes or locations, um, and we're going to basically create a parametric relationship between this point and sphere. So I'm going to plug this point into the B input of sphere, and you'll see it snaps on nicely. And what that will do is it'll update the location of this sphere to be located at wherever this point is. So what that means is if I move this point in Rhino, you'll notice that the sphere will update as well, and we can kind of easily move that around and see that relationship in place. Let's say we're happy with this sphere now, and we want to bring it into Rhino so we can make it part of our design. Obviously, it's a preview in Grasshopper, and we can't currently select it, but we can actually move it into Rhino through a process called baking. To bake a geometry, just right-click on the icon of your component, and you'll find a little bake option that comes up. I'm going to select that, click OK on the panel that comes up, and you'll see you get a baked sphere that represents this sphere that we had in Grasshopper. And it has no relationship to the parametric um, relationships we've built up in Grasshopper anymore. It's just a dumb geometry inside of Rhino. We can also bake components by clicking on the component itself and right-clicking somewhere on the canvas and selecting Bake. And we could also bake multiple components. So if I selected the point and the sphere, I could bake those guys out as well. And I would end up with two spheres that you'll see here, two points in that same point location that you see here. Grasshopper has some really great ways for us to control what we can and can't see in the Rhino preview. You probably already noticed, but when I click on a Grasshopper component, it turns green and the corresponding geometry turns green in Rhino. So if I click on my point, that also turns green. But we can actually um, manage this a little bit when we have much more geometry coming onto our canvas. For example, if I created a scale component and we scaled from the center point of um, this point here, we're going to scale this sphere, and maybe we scale it by a factor of two. You'll see I have a new sphere that's created as an output geometry from the scale component. And what we're starting to get is a little bit of an overlap with our geometry of our point, our initial sphere, and then our scaled sphere. What if I just want to preview this um, last sphere only? There's a couple of ways that we can go um, about doing this. Um, the easiest way is to just select all of the components that sit behind this um, scale and right click on the canvas and select the preview off um, option. They'll turn a darker shade of grey, you'll notice the difference in shades here, and that means that they're off inside the grasshopper window. So that means that we just see this scale option here. Another way to preview components um, selectively is to come up here and do the um, draw preview geometry for selected objects only. So if I click on that, everything's going to disappear unless I click on one of these components. So regardless of whether or not your component is previewed on or off, you'll be able to see what it looks like with this um, option selected here. So I can then click on these objects and clearly see which one um, or which geometry I've selected. And that's really helpful if you're trawling through a definition trying to kind of understand what's going on or what something's ha what a certain component is doing. I'm going to click that back off to go back to our um, normal mode. We could also turn this one on, which is just a wireframe preview. See the wireframe of our sphere. And then if we click on this one, it will turn the preview off altogether. I'm going to go back to just our standard, which is the draw shaded preview geometry and nothing else. Another helpful performance tip that's worth noting is that we can disable um, components inside of a grasshopper. So if I want to make this sphere not actually compute at all, I could click on it and right click and click on enabled. And that'll disable this component entirely. It'll turn a dark shade of gray and nothing's basically happening now. I could right click and re-enable it to get it back. If I disable this middle sphere, it means that the geometry coming into the scale component no longer exists, so I no longer have an input for that scale component. So just be aware that when you're disabling and enabling um, geometries or components in Grasshopper, if you have parametric relationships built up, those relationships will be affected by the disabling and enabling in your definition. One last little tip that I have around Grasshopper performance is the Grasshopper Profiler. Now this is a really fantastic tool that shows you uh, the speed of the components and how they're computing. If you've got a really slow um, computing 
um, definition, and you want to figure out what's causing the slowness, this is a really cool tool to have. To turn it on, go to Display, and under Canvas Widgets, there's a little option called Profiler. I'm just going to click that on. I'm going to create what's called a Populate 2D component. And that creates a random population of 2D points, basically. Um, and then I'm going to plug that into a Mesh Sphere component. So Mesh Sphere is a little bit different to a sphere. It creates a base type or data type of a mesh. And I'm going to plug that into the base and we're going to create a whole range of mesh spheres. We're not super interested in that right now. What we are interested in this is this um, little kind of uh, 7ms icon that's appeared below the grasshopper component. This is telling us the speed that this component is computing at. So when we kind of compute uh, these 100 mesh spheres at each of these points, it computes at you know this speed. So if you have something that's computing really, really slowly in Grasshopper, it'll actually turn red and you better isolate which component is causing you a bit of grief. Now that we've got a better understanding of the basics, let's try and design something in Grasshopper. Being an algorithmic tool, Grasshopper is really useful for designing amazing patterns. One commonly used tool by beginners in Grasshopper is the Voronoi pattern. A Voronoi pattern is a way of defining regions based on a collection of points, and they usually produce cellular patterns commonly seen in nature. So Grasshopper comes with a Voronoi component to help us create these patterns easily. If we just navigate up to the Mesh tab and go to the Triangulation drop-down menu, you'll find a collection of Voronoi components and options. I'm going to select the simple Voronoi component, click and drop it onto the canvas. So you'll notice nothing's actually happening right now, and we get a little error on our Vorino component telling us that the input parameter points failed to collect data. Let's have a look at the inputs we have for the Vorino component. We have a collection of points that will form the Vorino diagram. We have radii, as an optional cell radius. We have a boundary that we can contain our diagram within. And then we have an optional plane for the Vorino diagram to sit on. So the easiest way to get started with the Vorino diagram is to create a collection of points. Rather than clicking a collection of random points in Rhino and then referencing them in, we can really easily create a random collection of points using Grasshopper. If we navigate to the Vector tab and go to the Grid drop-down menu, you'll see a few Populate options. I'm going to select Populate 2D, and what this will do is create a collection of points within a boundary inside of Grasshopper. So you'll see if I click on it, I have all of these points specified in Grasshopper, and they're um, caught within this boundary of this rectangle here. So the Populate 2D component basically randomly generates points within this boundary. So the region is defined by a rectangle, which we see is that region that everything sits within. The count gives us the number of points to add, which is currently 100. So if we increase that, we'd have more. If we decrease it, we have less. The seed's quite interesting. This is how Grasshopper generates randomness. If we change that value from 1 to, say, 2, we'll get a different type of randomness, basically. And then you can also add to a pre-existing point population. So we're not really going to worry too much about the inputs right now. We're going to go straight ahead and use our point list we've generated and plug it straight into the Voronoi component so we can get our first Voronoi diagram. And you'll see straight away this cellular-like pattern appears um, around our points. And basically the way the Voronoi works is it measures the distance between neighbouring points, finds the midpoint, and find the perpendicular line between those points, and then just basically creates a cell around each of those um, neighboring points in their perpendicular line. So you'll notice I have a bit of an issue with my Populate 2D right now. The boundary extends really far out, way further than the actual specified boundary we have in our Populate 2D. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to add a region, which will be a rectangle, that will also act as the boundary for Voronoi. And I'm going to do that by creating a rectangle in Grasshopper. So I'm going to come up to here into the geometry container and create a rectangle. You can obviously double click and type rectangle on the canvas as well. And I'm going to right click on my rectangle container and set one rectangle. And you'll see in the top left I get a prompt just as if you were drawing a rectangle inside of Rhino. So I've got to specify the first corner of my rectangle. I'm going to specify it 0. Then I'm just going to make my rectangle a length of 50 by 50 units, and I'm going to hit return, and you'll see my kind of previewed rectangle comes here as this square we've created. I can go ahead and 
drop that into our populate 2D component and it'll immediately update and those 100 random points that we've generated will fit within this rectangle that we've specified. Now I also want to contain the Voronoi diagram within this boundary as well so I can drag that into the boundary input for the Voronoi and you'll see it just cuts off that extra outside bit and we get a nice simple cellular pattern for our Voronoi diagram. We could then go and add some more control over this. So I could go and change the count for the Populate 2D from 100 to maybe say 150. Oops, 150. Um, and that'll give me a denser um, diagram. So you see we're adding points to this population and then that affects the Voronoi pattern because it has more points as an input. So I could drag this slider up and watch my Voronoi diagram update. I could also make it less dense and much lower resolution as I drag that right down to say like 10. Um, so you can have a really quick um, play around with that kind of parametric relationship. Another really kind of helpful thing to note about this simple Voronoi um, component, um, I'm just gonna quickly create a new one to d show this, is that we could turn this into kind of like a facade pattern or something for a building or some kind of um, you know, construction project that you're working on um, with a different type of relationship. So this boundary that we actually have here, whilst it takes in a rectangle input, it can actually swap out to be a surface input. So if we create a simple surface inside of Rhino, say with like, you know, a plane. So this will just create like a nice simple two, um, 2D flat plane for me, which is a surface in um, Rhino, you can see there. And if I reference that surface in here, I'm going to go right click, set one surface, like that. Um, so you'll see that this surface is now tethered to my Rhino surface. It's referenced into Grasshopper, like how we referenced the points earlier. We could go and actually populate some points on top of this surface. So if we jump over to the Vector tab again and go to Grid, there's a Populate Geometry component. And this works very similar to the Populate To Do but it takes any kind of surface or volumetric geometry and basically puts points on top of that surface. So if I go and plug my surface into geometry, you'll see a bunch of points appear on the surface. And now as I move it around, they kind of follow that surface. So we can then go ahead and drop the population into points and we get our Voronoi diagram. And then this surface can also act as a boundary for our Voronoi pattern to cut it off. And this gives us a lot of control because now we can, you know, rotate this surface with our gumball and the Voronoi pattern will actually follow along with the surface at any kind of rotation that we put it on, which is a really great way to, you know, translate uh, something in, you know, a 2D surface into maybe a more three-dimensional form. And this works in the exact same way as the Populate 2D component. I could make a number slider for 150 increase the count, and I once again get that parametric relationship that we had before. So we could easily now go and turn this into a 3D Voronoi diagram. If we navigate to Mesh and go to Triangulation, you'll see there's a component called Voronoi 3D. I'm going to click on that and drop it onto the canvas. Now the Voronoi 3D component has less inputs. It's asking for a collection of points, and then it's asking for an optional boundary, or a box in this case. So the points for the Voronoi diagram that we could create, if we go back to our vector tab and go to grid, this time we could select the populate 3D component. And this doesn't just populate a geometry or a 2D plane, but rather a box specified us or by us or a region um, it's going to put those points within. So I'm going to drop that onto the canvas now. You'll see the region's asking for a defined box. I'm actually going to go and create a box component just a simple geometry container. You can find it under params, geometry. I'm gonna right click on the box and go set one box, starting from zero again. I'm just gonna do the same size as this rectangle. So I'm gonna go 50, 50, and then 50 up in the Z axis like that. And this will form as our region. So I'm gonna plug my box into there and you'll see I now have populated the inside of my box with you know 100 of these points. So I can go and put those points into the Voronoi 3D diagram. We can just make sure that it's capped within our boundary by putting the box in as the region. And now if we kind of preview off a few of these components that we have on our canvas, you'll see I get a 3D Voronoi pattern with 3D objects. And if I were to go and bake that, you know, I get all these kind of interesting cellular pieces of geometry.
Attractors in Grasshopper could essentially be thought of as relationships between objects that affect one or more other objects based on their distance between. It's a really great way to create simple and elegant patterns. Let's create a simple Voronoi attractor algorithm using a point in Rhino where the Voronoi cells will become smaller the closer they are to a point. Let's begin again by setting up a Voronoi relationship. So we dropped a rectangular component on the canvas last time and said set one rectangle. I'm going to go with 50 and 50 again as my size. I'll just delete that surface. I am then going to create a Voronoi component, just the standard Voronoi here. And I'm going to create a populate 2D component. I'm going to plug the region into the populate 2D and the boundary of the Voronoi. And then the Voronoi will have be taking the points of the populate 2D. So in Rhino, I'm going to create a point which is going to serve as our attractor point. And I'm just going to place it somewhere in the midst of our Vorano diagram, just there for now. In Grasshopper, I'm going to create a point container and I'm going to reference in our point from Rhino. So I'm going to set one point and select that point there. So as I mentioned, an attractor works based on distance. So let's measure the distance between this point and the center cells of each Voronoi um, cell that we've got. So I'm going to use a component called distance. And this is a really great component just for measuring the distance between points. So point A is going to be this collection, this list of points we've created here. And point B is just going to be our point. So what that will do if we create a panel is we create a series of number values that's basically a list telling me how far this point is to this point, this point to that point, this point to that point, on and on for 100 of those points. But what's interesting um, that we can leverage as the algorithmic knowledge here is that the points really close to the attractor point are all going to have really small values, and the points much further away are going to have really large values. So what we can do is we can leverage these values and create a relationship that could scale or change the size of these Voronoi cells. So I'm going to use a scale component. So this one here with the two circles, we've used it once before. And the geometry that I'm going to scale is these Voronoi cells. So I'm going to plug those cells in. We're plugging in 100 cells. By default, the scale component wants to scale from you know, a center of over here. So you see it's just scaling the whole thing down based on this point. But we can use our center of scaling as this list of populate 2D points, because item 1 in our list of cells is related to item 1 in the list of population. So this point is related to the same cell in these two lists. So I'm going to plug my population into the center, and you'll see it straight away scales down every single cell from its center point. Now, what we can then do is change the scaling factor. Right now we've got an overall scaling factor of half, 0.5. But we can use this distance to kind of leverage a new type of scale. If I plug that in right now, the scale is going to be too big. You get this kind of big mess of geometry, and we don't want that. So I'm going to press Control z um, what we want to do is we want to mathematically adjust these numbers. So I'm going to use a component called multiplication, which is just this one here. And we're going to multiply all of these distance numbers by a really, really small value. I'm going to go with 0 0.010 um, as my number. And that'll just give me, you know, a really small value to multiply by. We can kind of see now, you know, the original distances were like 34, 30, sometimes, you know, much higher than that, sometimes much lower. And the new values are much smaller than that. So they're, you know, down within this kind of factor that we've already got on our scale. So if I go and plug this multiplication into that factor we start to get a bit of a gradient. And in fact, I think this is probably too small a number slider. So I'm actually going to change it. I'm going to make it 0 0.020. And that'll give us a little bit more to, um, room to play with. And you can see now that I get this interesting kind of effect that's coming through based on this point. So if I go, I'm just going to delete that. I'm going to preview off all of these kind of items here. And you see we get this kind of sliding attractor, and we could change that slider to affect how that relationship's actually working. And as I move this point around, these, um, this attractor pattern that we've created actually updates. So wherever the point is, the cells actually get incredibly small. So we could then go and set up a similar relationship for, say, a 3D Voronoi. I might delete this 2D Voronoi and delete this Populate 2D. And we're going to replace it with a Populate 3D. 
I'll delete the rectangle as well because we want to create a box now as we remember. Um, so I'm going to create a box, right click, set one box, and I'm going to start it at zero. It's going to be 50 by 50 by 50 in the Z direction like that. And that will become the region of our populate 3D. So all of our points sit within there. Then I'm going to create a Voronoi 3D. And the points will be these points here. And the box will be that. And we could then, you know, set this relationship up again. Plug in the points to there. Plug in the geometry cells to here. And plug those population points into the center. And we get, you know, once again, a... Um, I'll preview that box up as well. A scale factor that gets smaller the closer you get to this point. Now, one issue that we start to get, if you kind of see over here, is you get some overlaps in this geometry because our, um, our multiplication isn't really working in the way we want it to. The moment we scale above one in this attractor point scenario, we get some kind of like clashing effects, basically. So there's actually a much more elegant way of setting up attractor points inside of Grasshopper. And it's with something called the um, remap component. So the remap component is a really great way at squishing down um, the number values that we have in a certain relationship. I'm just going to delete this multiplication component for now. And we're going to focus on what's coming out of distance. So right now, um, we've got a list of values in distance, and I'm not entirely sure what they range between. It looks like it's between 10 and about 60. And what we want to do is we want to squish those values down so they sit within a factor of like, I don't know, maybe 0 0.2 to 1. We don't want anything to be greater than 1 when we're scaling using this attractor relationship that we're setting up. So I'm going to figure out what this range is. We can figure out the range of a component by going to maths, domain and clicking on the bounds component and that'll tell us the minimum and maximum values or the domain of a series of numbers that we have or a list of numbers. So I'm going to drop that under the canvas. Out of our numbers component I'm going to plug in into numbers here and I'm going to plug this into the panel and you'll see that our range of values they sit between 6 and 66. Okay. So we want to squish this domain down. So the smallest number is, say, a 0 0.2, and the largest number is a 1. So it's almost like taking this big timeline of numbers, they sit on a timeline, squishing them right down, so it's 0 0.2 to 1. We can do that with the remap component. So it's called remap numbers. You can find it under domain, again, just here. Um, and the remap numbers has three inputs. It has the series of values we want to remap. Those would be our distances. We want to remap that list of distances and squish them down. It has a source domain. So that's asking for the domain of the current values that we have, which is this. We've already got this. And then it's asking for a target domain. So by default, it's set to 0 to 1, and we're going to affect that in a second. I'm just going to plug in a few things to get us started. So I'll delete this panel. We're going to plug in our values that we want to remap. Oops. Values. So from distance. We're going to plug in our source domain, which is, you know, the current domain or range of these values. And then we're going to create a custom target domain. So to create a custom target domain, we can go to construct domain. And we can basically tell the domain start, where we want the lowest number to be, and what the domain end, where we want the highest number to be. So I'm going to make the domain start 0.20, because I want that extra decimal place. I'm going to plug that into domain start. And the domain, domain end is 1. I'm just going to add a number slider that's 1.00 as well, though. And I'm going to plug that into domain end. And then I'm going to plug this new domain we've created to be our target domain. So now what we'll have is we'll have basically these values remapped so they're squished down to be, you know, between... Uh, 0 0.2 and 1. So if we look at this distance thing, look at number 8. Number 8 is our highest value. So remember the highest value in this domain was 66.37. So if I look at number 8, that is 66.37. That's being remapped to a value of 1 because the highest point of our new domain is going to be 1. So what that means for this is if you have a really small value near the point, it's Values are going to be remapped to approximately 0.2. And you have, if you have a really large value, the furthest point away from this attractor point we've created, it's going to be remapped to a value of 1. So I'm going to plug in these map values to the factor. And you'll see we get a really elegant kind of relationship. We no longer have that overlap effect that we had previously by using this remap values component.
I often get asked by my students how to create animations using Grasshopper. Of course you could just record your screen whilst dragging your number slider around, but there's actually a really easy way to create really sophisticated and professional animations using simple tools inside of Grasshopper. We're going to create an animation of our Voronoi tractor setup that we have from the previous tutorial. Before we start creating the animation, there's a few tweaks that I just want to make to this definition. I don't want to use a reference point from Rhino, I want to use a point that we kind of define um, inside a grasshopper that gives parametric control over this relationship. So the way I'm going to go and create that point is by creating a point under the point, or under the vector menu and point, and just go to construct point. And this will give us the chance to construct a point from its x, y, and z coordinates. So I'm actually going to override this point that we've referenced here and just delete that guy. Um, and by default, you know, once again, let's look at the inputs. 0, 0, 0 are the values for x, y, and z, which gives us a point at the origin um, of our, uh, our Rhino window. So what I want to do is create a point that as I drag a number slider, it will just kind of gradually move up to the top tip of our box that we've defined over here. So if you remember when we defined this box, we made it um, 50 units, um, whatever units you're working in. So I want to make the maximum point 50, 50, 50. So we're going to just create a number slider between 0 and 50. I just want to quickly talk about creating uh, more sophisticated number sliders. So previously we would just type in like, you know, a 50. Um, and then we get a number slider that's actually between 0 and 100. But we can control the domain of this number slider really easily. I could type in the start of the number slider that I want it to be, or the lowest value. I could type in a small then, and then type in a 50, and then I'll get a number slider between 0 and 50. I could also type in 0, so the smallest value I want in my number slider say 25 is like the value I actually want it to be set at initially and then small then again for a 50 for the highest and what this will give me is a number slider that's between 0 and 50 but starts with a value of 25 and I'll hit return like that and then of course you've seen me do this before but if we go and add um, some decimals to this so if I say 25.00 um, I will then get a number slider that sits between 0 and 50, has two decimal places, and starts at 25, like that. And this is the number slider that I want to use in this little exercise. If you ever want to change your number slider values, just double click on the number slider name, and you get a series of options that enable you to change the rounding to like integers, even, odd numbers, the number of digits you want or decimal places. You can easily double click and change the domain and the range, and then of course the current value that it's at. I'm going to now go and plug, well, I'm going to set this to zero. I'm going to plug this into the x, y, and z coordinates. So now what we'll get as I move that guy up is we get a nice relationship where that point moves through space and updates all of our attractors on a diagonal kind of vector, just like that. And it's the size of our box, so it fits perfectly within our attractor. So we want to create an animation of this. Right now, if we try to create an animation, it'll look like, you know, a grasshopper preview. And we want to dress this up a little bit so it looks kind of like swish and professional. Inside of grasshopper, we can actually make... Um, geometry look a little bit nicer using something called the preview component. So I'm going to double click on the canvas, I'm going to type in preview, and there's a custom preview component here. So this can be found under display and under preview, just here if you ever get lost. And what the custom preview component takes in is it takes it in a geometry to preview, and then a material that we're going to apply to that geometry. So if I plug in this geometry here, by default the material is actually pink. I'm going to preview um, this guy off here. And this takes in something called a color swatch. So a color swatch will enable us to change the material or the color value of the geometry we're displaying through our custom preview component. I'm just going to type in swatch, color swatch here. Um, and it's a really easy to use and kind of fun to use component. It's just got a color and then that goes in as the input, so I could change it to white. And if you want to change the color, you just click on the color swatch and a little kind of color menu comes up. If you want to change the color, adjust the hue. So I might go with like a nice shade of um, blue. Um, and if you want to change the saturation, just pull that up and drag it across. And of course, you can just drag around here and you notice it updates live in your Rhino window as well. So one thing to notice with your custom preview component is if I preview this off, you'll see it disappears. 
But if I now go into rendered mode, you'll see that my custom preview is still here despite being turned off. So custom preview always displays in rendered mode unless you right click and prompt it to not display in render. So if I click off render, it won't appear. We actually want it to display in render for this little exercise because we're going to do an animation of this. Um, but basically, if you're using render mode, just be aware that that custom preview is always going to appear unless you specify it off. So our animation is going to look something like this. We're going to kind of slide across through here all the way up to there. And I might actually delete that little reference point that we had previously. And I just want to make sure that, you know, this is a nicely centered animation like that. Um, so our animation is now going to basically sit here and we're going to create a bunch of frames that we can slide through. So the way you create an animation is actually the simplest part of this whole process. On any number slider, you can right click on the name and you click on animate. And what will appear is something called the animation controls window. So under animation controls, we can specify where our animation is going to save to what kind of format it's going to save in, the resolution, the number of frames, and then we get a small preview of what that is actually going to look like so we're aware of it. So because I'm in rendered mode, I'm going to get a rendered preview. Um, a lot of your settings will be a little bit different to mine because I've changed the defaults, but I'll talk through a few of the things I think you should change. The first thing you should do, I'm going to create a folder to save all these in because what the animation actually saves at is a collection of frames or image files. I'm saving mine as PNG files and these could easily go and be turned into an animation in say Photoshop or um, Adobe Premiere. On the desktop, make a new folder, I'm going to call it animation01 and I'm going to select OK and that's where it's going to save my animation to, to animation01. I think by default it's a BMP file. Just change that to a PNG file for the purpose of this exercise. I've got my viewport set mode set to perspective, which is just like the view you're currently in. I have my resolution set to 1920 by 1080, so the standard resolution of a computer display. And the frame count's currently set to 100. This is the number of images that your animation is going to generate. I'm going to leave that as it is, but if you want like a longer animation or a higher frame rate, you want to increase that size. So now I'm going to hit OK, and what will happen is it's going to create a frame, or 100 frames, for this number slider at a series of intervals. So you watch as I hit OK, the number slider is very slowly ticking up, and it's going and creating an image file for every single iteration of these frames. In the top left corner um, on the command line, you see kind of like an estimation of how much time is left um, to create this animation as it runs through. So it'll take a little bit of time for your animation to be done, but once it's completed, you can navigate to the folder, which is on my desktop, I've saved it, and you'll see here you get that collection of frames that dictate your animation. So then you can go into, um, you know, a Photoshop or, you know, an Adobe Premiere or something like that, and you can convert all of these really easily into a video that plays your animation and shows kind of that, you know, power of Grasshopper, that algorithmic relationship that you've created completely in play. Let's take a look at the Graft, Flatten, Simplify and Reverse tools in Grasshopper and how they can be used on objects, lists and data trees. Let's start by creating three simple lines in Rhino and reference them into Grasshopper. So I'm just going to draw a line like this and I'm going to rotate it with my gumball. You could rotate it with the rotate tool if you want. Um, I'm just going to move it to the origin point like that. And then I'm just going to make two more copies of it. So one, two, three, like that. So we've got three lines just sitting in Rhino. And then we're going to reference them into Grasshopper. So we want to do this using a curve container. I'm just going to drop a curve container onto my canvas. I'm going to right click and go set multiple curves. And then I'm going to select these three curves, hit return. Um, so we've got them referenced nicely into our Grasshopper definition. I'm going to create a panel and let's have a quick chat about these curves. So our three curves are referenced into one Grasshopper component and each curve is its own object. However, when they're all referenced together, they create what's called a list. So we've talked about lists in previous tutorials. Lists can be thought of as collections or groups. And they're important tools in Grasshopper as they allow us to control collections of data and match objects to one another from separate lists. 
As we saw in the last tutorial, we matched some Voronoi cells to distance number values to create our attractor point algorithm. So far we've discussed objects and lists in this tutorial series, but there's one other important data structure that we need to get familiar with, and that's the data tree. Data trees could be thought of as lists within lists. So take our curves for instance. What if we wanted to divide these curves into a series of evenly spaced points? I'm going to double click on the canvas and use the divide curve component, which is right here. And this is a component that will enable us to divide any curve into an equal length segment of points. So you'll see here we've got a curve input, the curves we wanted to divide, the count, which is the number of segments we want to divide, and then kinks. We're not going to worry about the kinks in this um, tutorial. So I'm going to plug the curves into divide curve, and by default the count set to 10. I'm actually going to maybe just make that 5 for now, just so it's a little bit more simple. So we have three curves, 1, 2, 3, and each of those curves is divided into 5 points. So let's see what happens when we plug our points into this panel. We actually get a list and another list and another list. So now we've got three lists sitting within our overall data. And this is what we call a data tree. So our data tree is organizing the data that we've created in Grasshopper in a way that's easy for us to manipulate and understand. We now have three lists sitting within our overall list, and each of those three lists relates to one of these three curves. So you could almost think of it as groups of points within the overall list. So we've got three curves, which means we have three groups of divisions, and within those groups we have six points. We can also view this using something called the param viewer. I'm going to drop a param viewer onto our canvas, and we're going to have a look at this. So we see here we have data with three branches in our data tree. So we have one group of points, which is related probably to this curve, a second group of points related to this curve, and then a third group of points related to this curve. Data trees are sorted using something called path numbers, and this helps split our data into separate lists. The path numbers are seen here on the left of the parameter viewer. If we wanted to locate point 3 in the second curve, we would just look inside path 0, 1 and find item number 3. When using Grasshopper, you may have noticed some of the icons that appear when you right click on the input or output of a component. These tools are data management tools, and they help give us greater control over the data we are using in Grasshopper. Let's talk about the reverse option first. The reverse option simply reverses the order of the visible list. So the data tree itself is not going to be reversed, but the objects on the lowest branch of the tree will, which is these lists. So what will happen is item number 5 will become item number 0, and 0 will go to item number 5, and vice versa, and we'll get a reverse list. I'll click and you'll see it happens. So you see 000 drops to the bottom, and 0099 goes to the top in this instance could unreverse that and we'll have our list back to normal. If we reverse the curve back here, that'll have a flown effect and suddenly we have this curve being the first in the list, this being the second and this being the third, which then divides these curves up, which means you get a slightly different data structure over here. The next one I want to talk about is simplifying. Simplifying removes the extra zeros from your data tree's path numbers. So these path numbers we were just talking about before, they generate an extra zero every time a data tree gets manipulated. So you see how I've got a 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 2. If you're working on a really complex algorithm, it's not uncommon to find yourself with lots of zeros. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2. Making your data harder to read. And that means it's harder to match with other trees and lists. To mitigate this problem, it's recommended to use the simplify option to remove these zeros and clean up your path numbers. So you see my path numbers now changed to 0, 1, and 2. Let's next talk about grafting. I'm going to make a copy of this curve component. We're going to do a little algorithm down here to show off how the grafting tool works. So if I create a parameter viewer, we can kind of see what's coming out of this um, curve that we've got here, which is a flat list of um, data with no branches and no data tree. Grafting is a way of turning a list into a data structure. If you graph a list of objects, the objects will then be put onto their own lists. So let's watch this in practice. I'm going to actually graft using a graft tree component here, okay? rather than right-clicking showing graph, just so we can compare these two. So I've got my graph tree here, 
and let's create another param viewer and see what happens. So you'll see the comparison here between this flat list um, of data with one branches versus the grafted version where every single curve that we have that we've referenced in is now put on its own um, branch. So we now have a data structure where these curves are on their own branch in the list. Where this gets interesting is when you try and operate on a data tree. So say for example, we wanted to loft these curves. I'm gonna use the loft component, which works the same way as the loft works in uh, Rhino. So we can loft these three curves in this uh, list that we have here, and we'll get a nice surface basically. It's reading all three um, curves in that list, and then it's lofting them. If we create another loft component, and we loft this grafted tree, I'll just preview that one off so we can see. You'll notice that we don't actually get a loft from this. So why is that? Grasshopper operates on a list level. So what it's doing when we loft these curves that aren't grafted is it's finding these three curves in a singular list and it's saying, okay, I'm gonna run a loft option on these three curves. Whereas if we look at our data tree, they're all on separate lists. So it's running the loft on this curve on its own then on this curve on its own, and then on this curve on its own. Grafting can also be used to match data trees together. Let's take a look at a quick example. I'm just gonna copy these guys from the top here again, and we'll drag this down to the bottom. So we've got our curve and our divided curves again. We could go and create maybe just a circle component, like this. I'm gonna plug the points coming out of the circle into this plane here and I might make the radius a little bit bigger. Let's make it 50, see what that looks like. Oh, they're a little bit too big. Let's make them about 15. There we go, perfect. And then like we've done previously in the previous tutorial, let's maybe scale uh, these circles. So these circles are still a data tree. You can kind of see if we have our parameter viewer, this data tree is carrying along the whole way through based on the division of curves. So we've got our three kind of um, lists within this data tree and they relate to these three lines that we've drawn initially and I am going to scale these um, geometries I'm going to scale them from the um, center points that we have coming out of divide curves so they're all just scaling based on those points based on their relative points so in this sense we've matched up these two data trees right we've got a data tree of points with three branches and then six points on each branch. And then we've got the same, we've got a data tree of circles with six circles on each branch. And they're basically operating on each other. Now we can actually use graft to change how we go about scaling each of these uh, circles that we have here. I might preview a couple of these guys off like that. I am going to just create a panel. And into that panel, I am going to type in the numbers one, two, and three like that. Um, we're going to turn this panel into a list. To turn the panel into a list, just right click on uh, the panel and select multi-line data. And you'll see straight away, the panel is assigned um, some values. So we've now got a list of numbers coming out of this panel. I'm going to create an integer container. So that's this container here. Um, and I'm going to plug those uh, numbers into here. And we're basically going to scale um, these circles based on these integers. But basically what I wanna do is I wanna scale the circles that are on this curve by a value of one, the circles that are on this curve by a value of two, and the circles that are on this curve by a value of three. If I go and plug this into the factor, it won't do that right now. What it's actually doing is it's scaling the first item in this uh, circle list, which is this bottom circle here, by a factor of one, it's scaling the second item by a factor of two, and then it's scaling the third onwards by a factor of three. And then it's doing the same for each of these curves. And that's because we have a little bit of a misalignment in our data structures. If we wanna match these data structures, we can easily just use the graph function. So the data structure that we wanna to get to is something like this, where we have three branches, and we're able to operate on each of those branches using this panel. So let's go and create another param viewer. I'm gonna plug that into there. If I right click on this integer component and I graft, we now have a data structure that matches up with this parameter viewer. So now what's happening is for the first group or for the first group of data coming out of the circles, we are applying 
um, the first branch from this data structure, which is one. So we're scaling by one here. Then for the second branch, we're scaling by this second branch, which is two. And then for the third branch, we're scaling by the third branch, which is three. We could then go and loft these curves like this. And you'll see once again, the loft only operates on that list level. So it's taking the three curves, I'll plug that into here, coming out of the first branch and lofting them all together. Then the curves coming out of the second, lofting them together, then the curves coming out of the third and lofting them together as well. So let's talk about the last option. We've discussed reverse, we've discussed graft, and we've discussed simplify. Let's talk about flatten. Flattening is probably the easiest of the options to understand. Flattening simply turns any data tree into a long list and removes the data structure entirely. So up here I've got a data structure, but if I select flatten, you'll see my data structure is completely removed. And I just have one fl flat list of 18 points. We can visualize this with a panel. We no longer have a data structure here. We've just got a list of flat circles. And then plugging this into the loft uh, component means it's going to try and loft every single one of these circles. So you see it lofts from here all the way around and then it goes back to the next curve again and all the way around because we've now got a completely flat list of data. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an understanding as to how data trees work and how to use the graft, flatten, simplify and reverse options inside of Grasshopper. Data trees enable you greater control over your designs in Grasshopper, but the only way to master them and understand them completely is to keep practicing. Possibly the most powerful thing about Grasshopper is its vast collection of plugins that extend Rhino's capabilities, which opens up limitless possibilities for your design. Let's take a look at where to download plugins and how to install them. The best location to download any Grasshopper plugin is foodforrhino.com. Food for Rhino collects most Grasshopper plugins ever created on its website, and you can easily search for any that you're looking for. I'm going to try and install the Anemone plugin, which is a looping plugin that enables to create loops within our Grasshopper algorithms. So I'm going to type Anemone, and I'm going to hit search. And the first one with this kind of like Anemone looking thing is the one that I want to select. I'm going to click on it. And it'll take us to the Anemone plugin page on the Food for Rhino website. So there's a few different uh, options down here as to what we can download. You always want to try and download the most recent version, which would be Anemone 0.4. So I'm just going to hit download. And I'll get a little GHA file. Some plugins have more than one file, and you might get a zip file that you need to unzip. So what do we do with this GHA file? We need to copy it into what's called the Grasshopper Libraries folder. So if we flick back to Rhino, and we have Grasshopper open, you can find the Libraries folder by navigating to File, Special Folders, Components folder. And you'll see you get this uh, folder called Libraries that you're stuck in. I've got one plugin installed right now called Bifocals, and this enables me to see the names of each component above the component on the canvas. What we want to do now is place our Anemone plugin, the GHA file, into this Libraries folder. So I'm going to go to my Downloads. I'm going to right click on Anemone and I'm going to cut it, go back, and now I'm going to place or paste this file into the libraries folder. Now before you get started, there's one thing you need to check. Always right click on the GHA file or whichever file you're copying in and check properties. You need to unblock the file before you can use it inside of Rhino. So it's, sometimes you get this warning in Windows, this file came from another computer and might be blocked to help protect the computer. You need to hit unblock and go apply, otherwise Grasshopper won't be able to lo load the plugin. So generally speaking, any plugin that you download, you want to copy and paste the files into the library folder. Once you're done copying and pasting, you then want to close Rhino and Grasshopper, and then restart it. Get Grasshopper up again. And you'll see we have the Anemone plugin installed into Grasshopper. Some of the plugins I recommend downloading include the Anemone plugin, which enables you to create loops and simulations. The Weaverbird plugin, which gives you greater control over mesh geometries in Grasshopper. The Pufferfish plugin, which is a great suite of tools for tweening objects and creating complex geometries.
and the Chromodorus plugin, which allows you to create isosurface meshes. Grasshopper also comes installed with the Kangaroo 2 plugin, which is a fantastic physics engine you can use in your design process. There are a whole series of other plugins that are also fantastic tools you can use in Grasshopper. Now that you've got a base understanding of how Grasshopper works, let's discuss five helpful tips to improve your Grasshopper workflow. Often you'll find a new component in a Grasshopper definition, but it's not always obvious where it's located in the Grasshopper toolbar. If you hold down Ctrl, Alt, and then click on a component with your left hand mouse button, a collection of red markers will appear on the Grasshopper canvas to show you where the component can be found. Locating a specific component's geometry in Grasshopper can be hard if your definition gets quite complex. Luckily, there's a zoom tool that helps us locate the geometry related to any component. Simply select on a component, then right click on an empty spot in the Grasshopper canvas and select zoom, and you'll be zoomed in to the, ge the component's geometry straight away. Sometimes you want to use the data being output from a component without relying on previous components in the definition. If you create a data container of the same geometry type as an output, you can plug it in, then right click and select internalize data. This breaks any parametric relationships and stores the data in this component. The component can be reused or even copied and taken to a new Grasshopper file. Grasshopper algorithms can get messy very quickly and it's easy to get lost in the sea of wires and batteries. So it's important to organize your definition in a way that you or anyone else who uses it can easily understand which parts of the definition are serving what purpose. The easiest way to do this is to group your Grasshopper components based on a function they might serve by selecting them, right clicking somewhere on the Grasshopper canvas, and choosing Group. You can easily name the groups so it's clear what the function of any group is doing. You could right click on a group, and then just type in a name. The sketch tool is a handy tool to leave notes for others in your Grasshopper file. Just click on the pencil icon below the component tabs and start drawing. If you're handing your Grasshopper file to someone else, it might be helpful to leave them a few tips explaining your definition. Hopefully you found these tips useful and you can introduce them to your own Grasshopper workflow.